Wednesday afternoon. We'll, take, we'll go right back now to continue the study of the um, ministry of Christ as the Holy One, the one who gives us the perfect example of obedience on the one side and trust on the other side, and who never in the slightest degree ever deviated, of course, from the principles of holiness. <clears throat> Move on now to page 138. And, um, thank you. On page 138 we read these words. Jesus came in poverty and humiliation, that he might be our example as well as our redeemer. If he had appeared with kingly pomp, how could he have taught humility? How could he have presented such cutting truths as in the Sermon on the Mount? Where would have been the hope of the lowly in life and had Jesus come to dwell as a king among men? To the multitude, however, it seemed impossible that the one designated by John should be associated with their lofty anticipations. Thus, many were, dis excuse me, many were disappointed and greatly perplexed. The words which the priests and rabbis so much desired to hear that Jesus would now restore the kingdom to Israel had not been spoken. For such a king they had been waiting and watching, such a king they were ready to receive, but one who sought to establish in their hearts a kingdom of righteousness and peace they would not accept. The spirit of holiness, which is the spirit of obedience of course, does not map out preconceived courses for God to follow, does not make, um, does make, not, does not make up his mind that God is going to come in a certain way. And when God doesn't come in the way they expect he shall come, then of course they reject him completely. Now we know of course that in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which most of us have come, and which maybe some of us still are, the Adventist Church has formed some very, very definite ideas and all things are measured by those ideas. For instance, they believe that they are the final movement upon this earth and therefore no other movement can ever come. They are the third angel's movement. They, they don't see the fourth, the fifth, the sixth and the seventh as outlined in Revelation 14 and 18. And they have very fixed ideas then about their status and their position and all things are measured by those ideas. So much so that um, one test of truth in their minds is it must come through the general conference. Isn't that right? It's a fixed idea in their minds. And because of this fixed idea, many people, when you present to them a saving message, simply say, well, now, is this book um, written by or published by the Pacific Press or Review and Hill or something like that? Now, those folk back there had very, very different ideas about how the Messiah would come he would come as a very dignified person, he would come as a great conqueror, a liberator like Gideon or David or uh, Jephthah or, or one of those, or Joshua. And he would marshal the hosts of Israel in battle formations and, and they would then go out to conquer the Roman power. They looked for a man who would be like themselves, a hater of the Romans, someone who was proud and despotic. And when Christ did not come as they expected he should come, as they as they formed in their minds to expect him to come, then they turned their backs upon him completely. Now that this is good. You, we can hardly find a more serious mistake than this, and um, therefore it is most important that we keep our minds open to whatever way God shall choose to use. We must not limit God in the slightest degree. However God desires to use us or to move us, we are to be usable, we are to be uh, pliable um, and, uh, and be as instruments in the hands of God and not have preconceived ideas which limit the way in which God can go about his work. And that of course is the spirit of submission. Now this brings us down now to um, the, the, the fact that um, when the multitude at large proved themselves unable to recognize the person of Jesus Christ as the Messiah, then we find that John was led to, to direct the attention of his disciples to Jesus Christ personally. No longer the multitude at large, but now just the disciples. On um, page 138 still, on the following day, 
while two disciples were standing near, John again saw Jesus amongst the people. Again the face of the prophet was lighted up with the glory from the unseen as he cried, Behold the Lamb of God. These words thrilled the hearts of the disciples. They did not fully understand them. What meant the name that John had given him, the Lamb of God? John himself had not explained it. Leaving John, they, they went to seek Jesus. One of the two was Andrew, the brother of Simon, the other was John the, John the Evangelist. These were Christ's first disciples. Moved by an irresistible impulse, they followed Jesus, anxious to speak with him, yet awed and silent, lost in the overwhelming significance of the thought, is this the Messiah? My mind, of course, um, remarks on how easily Christ now began to attract disciples to himself. He didn't go out and work at persuading men in fact how much effort do we find Christ having put into the work of soul gathering or proselytizing up until this point none, none whatsoever none at all and yet an irresistible urge moved these two men to come to Jesus Christ to ask him questions about the mission which he has come to fulfill now what was drawing them the Spirit of God, right? And of course at the same time the love of God which was present in the heart and life of Jesus Christ. But now first of all remember that these two disciples had received the ministry of John the Baptist. They had become deeply repentant for their sins. The work of God's grace had worked in their hearts and the doing of this groundwork had prepared them now for the ministry of Jesus Christ. And so... It was a case of moving on from one step to the next step as they came into contact with him. <clears throat> Remember, of course, that we, um, we read in uh, Christ Object Lessons, now I beg your pardon, it's Desire of Ages 208, 208 in, in Desire of Ages in regard to the way in which the Pharisees and the rabbis schemed and planned to build up God's kingdom. I think this is the statement... Um, and maybe I'm wrong in this respect, I thought this is where it says that the, uh, the Pharisees and the, and the rabbis um, were men who schemed and planned to build up the work of God. It must be back in Christ our big lessons in the statement in regard to the mustard, mustard seed. Right, uh, yes, on page 77 of the book uh, Christ Object Lessons and talking about the difference between Christ's kingdom and that of the worldly kingdoms it says the Jews look for the king kingdom of God to be established in the same way as the kingdoms of the world to promote righteousness they resorted to external measures they devised methods and plans right they devised methods and plans and that is the way of the world human beings devising methods and plans to promote righteousness inasmuch of course as human plan making is unrighteousness in the first case and how can you promote righteousness by unrighteous methods it's not an impossibility and this was a great difference now we don't find Jesus Christ devising methods and plans in reaching out to lay the foundations of the Christian church by calling the first disciples to follow him and become a part of his organization <clears throat> now my mind goes back of course to the old Seventh-day Adventist church methods to which, of which I was once a part I remember when I, I, remember when I was a, um, a church mystery leader at Longburn College in New Zealand and how we got together Sabbath by Sabbath and, uh, and we laid plans we worked out schemes and so forth to go out and build up the church of God by knocking on doors giving out pieces of literature trying so hard to get conversations going bringing up new ways and schemes to get an interest from the people and so forth and so on and it was hard work wasn't it it was discouraging work it was miserable work I never enjoyed it I used to, I used to do it only for my sense of obligation and duty <clears throat> never because I loved to do it then I, <clears throat> then I remember when this message came to me well, I should also mention the fact that uh, before this message came I was quite frequently appointed as a matter of duty all the faculty members of the college were given the same responsibilities 
I was quite frequently appointed to take my turn at conducting chapel services and uh, Friday evening vesper services and church services on the Sabbath day, not only at the college but, but in other churches around the district as well. And I remember scratching my head and sitting down with all the books and trying to say, now what will I get up this weekend? And I think and think and think and finally find a text and uh, add a few more texts to it and go to the great sheaf of notes to preach the sermon on Sabbath. Those were the good old days. <laughs> And it was hard, frustrating work, believe me. But when this message came, how changed things were in every respect, I suddenly found that um, now I had a living message in myself and, a living ex and which gave me a living experience in that message. And I found that uh, I never needed to sit down for long, studious hours preparing sermons, that, that I would just stand up and tell what God had done for me and show from the, from the Bible scriptures, of course, what God would do for the people in turn. And that's, of course, um, 30 years ago now, and I've never used notes and sermons ever since that point of time. Because when you have a message to give, you don't need to be resorting to something supportive in the way of notes and the like, or you might need some time, some, sometimes to keep some dates in mind or some historical references, but generally speaking, we don't need them. <clears throat> and in 1960, of course, I learnt the lesson of putting myself at God's disposal, to speak or not to speak, to go or to stay, only as he directed. And the, and the, and the tools in the woodwork shop, which, uh, <clears throat> which were there at the service of the carpenter, were an inspiration to me in this particular respect. And I constantly think of the story of um, the work in Samaria, and of course of the reaching out to, uh, to gather in the... Um, the uh, eunuch who was going down to Ethiopia has always been a very, very definite inspiration for me as well. I'd like to just uh, turn now to the work of Philip in Samaria in the book Acts of the Apostles, page 107. First of all, I'll read page 107 in Acts of the Apostles. Philip's work in Samaria was marked with great success and thus encouraged he was sent to Jerusalem for help. The apostles now perceive more fully the meaning of the words of Christ, you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. While Philip was still in Samaria, he was directed by a heavenly messenger to go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, and he arose and went. He did not question the call, nor did he hesitate to obey, for he learned the lessons of conformity to God's will. And at that point, again, he did not question the call. Now, for instance, if we think of the work of Philip at this time, we just draw here a very rough little map of uh, Palestine. Here is the Jordan, the Sea of Galilee, and the Dead Sea lower down. Of course, as we know, the bottom province was called Judea, where Jerusalem was the capital. Then the middle portion was called Samaria, and the top portion was called Galilee. It's a very rough map, but it does serve to give a rough picture of the situation. Now, up here in Samaria, Philip was, was conducting a very successful ministry, so much so he, he needed to call for help from Jerusalem. But while he was at the very height of this success, the Spirit of God sent him to go down by the way of Gaza, which is, which is down in this general direction, and he was to meet there a lone person. Now, now Philip could have said, but Lord, look, I'm... I'm really up to my ears in work here. I've got a very, a very prosperous ministry going here. I don't want to leave all these souls. Why should I now go down to there? But he did not question the call. Why not? Because it says here, nor did he hesitate to obey, for he had learned the lesson of conformity to God's will. He had learned that lesson and become a built-in principle into Philip's life to do what God gave him orders to do. So with Philip, he asked the question, what are my orders? And he went. And so, first of all, God orders sent him to Samaria. He established a very successful work there. And God, foreseeing the need for Philip to leave there and go down to meet this Ethiopian eunuch, the, um, the Lord gave him fresh order. Well, the Lord impressed him to send to Jerusalem for help, which came up there to, to carry on during his absence. Then the Lord gave him fresh orders, namely to go down and meet this Ethiopian eunuch, which he did. And we know the story of how the, um, the Ethiopian was greatly blessed and actually converted and then baptized as a result of Philip's ministry. 
We know too the subsequent wonderful effects of that encounter because the while well, Philip met only one person, that's all he met. Yet that man went home carrying the gospel to the land of Ethiopia or Abyssinia, whichever you wish to call it. And uh, so great was the impact of that man's ministry that Ethiopia became a Sabbath-keeping nation for many, many centuries and remained so until the Roman Catholic uh, armies went down there and forced them to take up Sunday-keeping. But eventually, of course, when they threw out the Catholics again, they went back to Sabbath-keeping. And I believe even today, the, the National Day of Worship in Abyssinia is still the Sabbath day. I'm not really sure about that altogether. I think it is. Now, the question is, it would have been a much shorter journey for, for Philip to have gone and met, met the Ethiopian in Jerusalem. But the Lord seemed to meet him far down the road, which cost Philip, of course, a great deal more time and effort. Now, why was it that God sent Philip there and not back here? The simple answer is, of course, that while the Ethiopian is still in Jerusalem, is not yet ready for Philip's ministry. There was still further work to be done before that time came. And so God, by his Spirit, or through his Spirit, knowing the exact time and place where, where we had to meet a person, sent Philip down to meet that man right at the right time and the right place. Now that's why it's so important for us to be directed by God to the place where we uh, deliver the message to people because only God knows when the person we are to meet is ready to receive the message God has given us to give that person. And I can testify in my own work that when I come to a person whom I've never met before, if that person has been worked upon by the Spirit of God, and if that person has been made ready by the Spirit to receive my message, what is the result I achieve? Success. The person accepts the message. But if that person has not been prepared by the Spirit for the message, then all my talking is, is quite futile. It's quite pointless and purposeless. Now on the next page, page 109, we read these very wonderful words. This Ethiopian represented a large class who need to be taught by such mysteries as Philip, men who will hear the voice of God and go where he sends them. And what kind of mystery was Philip? We read it on the page before, where it says that he did not question the call, nor did he hesitate to obey, for he'd learned the lesson of conformity to God's will. Now that's the kind of missionaries a large class of people need in the world today. That is, men who will hear the voice of God and go where he sends them. There are many, <coughs> pardon me, there are many who, who are reading the scriptures who cannot understand their true import. All over the world, men and women are looking wistfully to heaven. Prayers and tears and inquiries go up from souls longing for light, for grace, for the Holy Spirit. Many are on the verge of the kingdom waiting only to be gathered in. <clears throat> An angel guided Philip to the one who was seeking for light and who was ready to receive the gospel. And today, angels will guide the footsteps of those workers who will allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify their tongues and refine and noble their hearts. The angel sent to Philip could, have, could himself have done the work for the Ethiopian, but this is not God's way of working. It is his plan that men are to work for their fellow men. Now just as surely as the angel guided Philip to the one who was seeking for light and who was ready to receive the gospel, the angel today will guide the footsteps of those workers who, who will allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify their tongues and refine and ennoble their hearts. Now we're talking now about the the way in which so nice and easily, nicely and easily, Christ began to attract the Sabbath to himself. He didn't have to beat his head against the wall and go from door to door to door to door trying to get folk to pay attention to him, but rather he quietly mingled with the crowd. He let the light shine out from his person and this gathered disciples to Jesus Christ. They were drawn by an irresistible urge to come to him. Now, isn't that a much nicer way of building God's kingdom than banging on doors down street after street after street? Which way, which way would you rather do it? The answer is obvious, isn't it? And likewise, <clears throat> in the case of um, Philip in Samaria, the angel sent him to that man who was in need 
and and Philip didn't have to go and find him by going by 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 eliminating perhaps a thousand contacts first until he finally reached him. Of course, I could develop this thought quite extensively. But we've done so in the Sabbath rest series, so I shan't do say too much more about it at the moment, except to emphasise again the fact that the way in which Jesus Christ did his work was so nice and so pleasant and so devoid of that very frustrating, discouraging business of going to thousands of people in order to find one or two if you're fortunate. And I must say that um, the way that I've been able to work in the last 30 years in presenting this message without seeking for converts but just simply letting God bring me to people and they to me as the case may be, I like it very, very much and I wouldn't change it for anything. And one thing I have bad memories about is, is the old days when I used to go from door to door trying to find contacts in the Adventist way. So these two men then, namely uh, Andrew and um, John, now came out and followed Jesus to find out where he lived. I read now again on page 138. Jesus knew that the, that the disciples were following him. They were the first fruits of his ministry and there was joy in, it, in the heart of the divine teacher as these souls responded to his grace. Yet turning he asked only, What seek ye? What do you want? He would leave them free to turn back or to speak of their desire. So Christ almost discouraged them from coming after him, didn't they? He didn't, he didn't urge them to come. He said, Well, what do you fellows want? What are you looking for? Of one purpose only were they conscious, one presence filled their thought, they exclaimed, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? In a brief interview by the wayside, they could not receive that which they longed. They desired to be alone with Jesus, to sit at his feet and hear his words. He said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day. Now, just as a little point, to the side I just wonder where Christ found the place to dwell that particular day this was a long long way away from uh, where Christ normally lived up in Nazareth Nazareth was clear up here in the north in, in, in Galilee and uh, this location was down here somewhere close to the Jordan River just north of the Dead Sea and um, you, 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 wouldn't, you would expect it out there there might be an inn, it's doubtful though, and I think that Christ was more inclined to stay with people than he was to stay in a, in a uh, public house. But one thing must be remembered, that while Christ was not known widely in this area, that during his childhood and youth and, and young manhood, he certainly had made lots of friends by his kindly ministry. And it was very possible that one of the folk whom he served up here, maybe even one who had received the miracle working power manifest during his youth, and young manhood had, had moved down to this part of the world so when Christ came down he probably found a room waiting for him in the, in the home of a friendly person we don't know of course and I'm just sort of thinking about it there a little speculatively but uh, I, I rather enjoy thinking about the possibilities in that respect so they came and saw where he dwelt and dwelt with, him that, dwelt with Jesus Christ that day and in this most inconspicuous way in this very humble and quiet manner the, the Saviour began to began his ministry by gathering to himself his first con converts, his first contacts, his first disciples, namely, of course, Andrew and John. Now, over the next uh, two pages or so, we find that um, these two men in turn began to call their friends, their relatives and brothers, and just their friends and acquaintances. And so we find that... Um, well, Christ, uh, first of all, Christ found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Philip obeyed the command and straightway he also became a worker for Christ. He called Nathaniel. And as you know, of course, Nathaniel asked the question, Can there come any good thing out of Nazareth? And uh, Philip uh, simply said to Nathaniel, Well, you just come and see and you'll find out for yourself. And so in this most <coughs> remarkable manner, Jesus Christ began to, to lay the foundations of the Christian church in a manner so totally different from that which is employed by the churches of the world. I don't need to comment, of course, on the difference between this and the ways of public evangelism, where the evangelist has a budget of so many tens of thousands of dollars. He rents a large auditorium. He has a team of uh, skillful uh, public relations people and other workers. He advertises on television, radio and the newspapers. He puts billboards up all over the country. 
he hides the real nature of his mission behind the facade down in Australia for instance the Adventist evangelist used the caption dead men do tell tales and offered the people a very interesting travelogue through uh, Bible lands Egypt and Palestine with all kinds of beautiful movies and slides of all these things they had find, find, find the oldest Bible campaigns and who, who's the oldest Christian campaigns and all kinds of things like this and the people went along and they hadn't the least idea this was a Seventh day Adventist evangelistic campaign but notice that at the very outset there was no subterfuge as far as Christ's ministry was concerned John said this is the Messiah was that an open statement? absolutely this is the one who comes after me he didn't, he didn't say the word Messiah but he said enough to say the same thing in other words so from the very beginning Christ um, laid, laid down the declaration of who he was where well, Seventh-day Adventist evangelists don't usually tell the people that until they've got them hooked as you might say after 10 or 15 presentations and the interest has been awakened <clears throat> I remember um, out in Washington D.C. a number of years ago now I've just forgotten exactly what year it was, it was back in the early 70s or maybe just the six, late 60s probably the early 70s the um, uh, one, one of our folk had come back from Germany and he had um, arranged for me to meet in a special worship room up in the actual college buildings and I said that's impossible I said um, I, I, can't, uh, I can't use that room what well, he said is it's open to anyone who wants to come and, um, and uh, talk with the students I said look I know perfectly well that um, the, the college leaders in this place are hostile to what I teach and what I, where I stand and I said I'm not going to go up there and act any kind of deception from the very outset they must know I'm not a member of the church that I'm not building up the Seventh day Adventist church in any sense of the word whatsoever and if they still want to hear well and good if they don't then of course that's their choice so I went up there and of course the, uh, the students had assembled about 20 or 30 of them and I, said, I, and I explained to them very openly and plainly who I was, where I came from, my position in relationship to the church and uh, I said we can't meet here because of this, we'll have to meet somewhere else we arranged a different meeting place and I was glad to see that most of those students come to hear me anyway which was very encouraging and they could never turn around and say at the end that I had deceived them and I don't believe that subterfuge and deception has any part to play in the building of God's church today at any time whatsoever now of course naturally of course you don't that doesn't mean to say you have to tell, tell people everything the first time you see them I wouldn't say to, the Roman, to a Roman Catholic the first time I met him say you're Pope's the Antichrist you know <laughs> <laughs> I reserve that for later <laughs> That wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be a very good plan at all but at the same time uh, I wouldn't hide who I was well I wouldn't call, he, call his Pope the Antichrist I wouldn't hide who I was if, and if he asked any questions in that direction I was telling him frankly and openly <clears throat> now the, let's pass on now to the next chapter at the marriage feast um there's quite some very wonderful thoughts of course in the mission of these men in calling um, friends and others to join with Jesus Christ but I don't want to slant our studies in that particular direction we're concerned now with the manifestation of Christ's life as the Holy One now we come to the marriage feast at Cana and Cana as you know of course was just a little bit not very far away from Capernaum and where was Capernaum? it was on the northern shores of the Lake Galilee up there in the northern province way up on the top top of uh, that particular province now the, on page 144 the chapter starts with the words Jesus did not begin his ministry by some great work before the Sanhedrin at Jerusalem at a household gathering in a little Galilean village his power was put forth to add to the joy of a wedding feast thus he showed his sympathy with men and his desire to minister to their happiness in the wilderness of temptation he himself had drunk the cup of woe he came forth to give to men the cup of blessing by his benediction to hallow the, the relations of human life now keep your finger on page 144 and then go across to page 161 and um, we note now a rather interesting development in the ministry of Jesus Christ 
Now on page 144 you're told that Christ began his ministry at a household gathering in a little Galilean village where his power was put forth to add to the joy of a wedding feast. On page 161 it says, In the cleansing of the temple, Jesus was announcing his mission as the Messiah and entering upon his work. Now that doesn't seem to be a contradiction, as they seem to be, because on page 144 it says that Christ began his ministry in this, in this little household gathering. On page 161 it says he entered upon his work at the cleansing of the temple in Jerusalem some, well, days anyway, maybe a week or two, maybe even a month later than this point of time. Now, <clears throat> Christ began his serving of mankind at the marriage feast. There's no question about that. And there's, v and there's very, very great significance in Christ doing that. He made a statement by, uh, a very important statement by um, beginning his ministry at the marriage feast. <clears throat> and he also made a very important statement by commencing his work or entering upon his work. Um, <laughs> in the cleansing of the Temple of Jerusalem just a few weeks later. And we'll compare these two um, commencements, if we might call them that, as we move along into this study. <clears throat> now, obviously, the, it, there's a very important significance about this wedding feast because Jesus Christ, after having gathered several disciples, and after having quietly disappeared in the Jordan River and being almost forgotten by the people, then journeyed all the way from Beth Abar or Beth Abra there on the, on the Jordan River. He travelled all the way north to Cana, which of course was a considerable journey. There was no record of any teaching or ministry along the way. No miracles were performed as far as the records go. And Christ made that very long, arduous journey up to Cana of Galilee he performed the um, miracle at the wedding feast. He went across to Capernaum for a few days and came all the way back down to the Passover again. Right? Where he cleansed the temple, where he cleansed the temple of the, of the, of the buyers and the sellers. Now, so short a time interval lapsed between his leaving the Jordan and going up there and coming back again, and the only significant thing he did on that whole journey was to make their water wine. So, therefore, it must have been very important for Christ to begin his ministry at that marriage feast. It must have been very important. Otherwise, why travel all that way to do it and come all the way back again? You think that uh, with the Passover coming on, you say, well, there's no point in going all the way up there now. Let's stay down here until the Passover where I can announce my mission and begin my work in earnest. But no, he travelled all that way up there and I've, I haven't taken time to figure out the mileage, but it must have taken quite a few days of tramping to, to make that journey. And let me stress again, there's no record of any miracles being performed, of any services being, of any sermons being preached, of any teachings being expounded during that period of time between his going up there and arriving at the marriage feast at Cana. Now, <clears throat> what then, what then would, would send Christ up there? Obviously, of course, his father's orders. That's self-evident because God did nothing excepting his father made the plan for him Desire of Ages, page 208, makes that very clear. So therefore, in the mind of God, that was a very important thing. Now, we do know, of course, that Christ did nothing insignificant. Everything that Christ did had a very, very great significance. When Christ, for instance, healed the blind man, there was much more to that than simply healing the blind man. Let's just quickly review that story to make my point of the significance of Christ's actions. The story is told in John, I think, about the 8th chapter of a blind man sitting by the roadside. Now, in the previous chapter, Christ had tried to bring to the Pharisees the teaching that I am the light of the world, he said to them. I am the light of the world. And the Pharisees had completely rejected that message on Christ's behalf. Now, by rejecting that message, they demonstrated they were blind. Let's just draw a circle here. Within that circle we find the Pharisees, P for Pharisee and B for blind. Okay. Now they cast Jesus out, so here is Christ outside of their circle, and as he passed by he saw this blind man. So here was this blind man, now what that man was physically, they were spiritually. Is that right? What they were, what he was physically, they were spiritually. So Jesus Christ did for that blind man physically 
but he's trying to do those those blind those, those blind people spiritually and then as Christ knew would happen because of this healing this man was then I should put the blind man inside the circle because he was inside the circle with them rather than out here on the outside and naturally because of this miracle that man came to the attention of the Pharisees and when he came to the attention of the Pharisees and gave his witness that man or through that man Christ was now sending a love letter to the Pharisees and, and saying to them now look what I have done to this man physically is a demonstration of what I'll do for you spiritually if you only let me do it but they wouldn't let him do it and finally they cast him out too they cast this man out of the synagogue but they cast him out into good company didn't they into Christ's company because Christ was cast out and he was cast out with Christ and that was into very very good company so there was a great significance in the healing of that blind man must we not then expect to find a deep significance in the fact that Jesus Christ went so much out of his way to be present at a marriage feast at the very beginning of his ministry doesn't that, doesn't that sound or doesn't that present itself as a very logical conclusion to draw in this particular respect now <clears throat> The whole gospel plan is hinged around the marriage and Jesus Christ had to come down and marry into humanity in order to effect the plan of salvation. We'll start, we'll, we'll just examine this not in too much depth and detail because um, it would take a lot of time of course to study the full depth and extent of the marriage but let's turn to the great controversy for a moment and read a statement in regard to the marriage which took place back in 1844 and um, also in regard to the marriage which will take place when Jesus Christ is married to the New Jerusalem Great Controversy page 427 is the reference in this respect actually we'll go back and start on page 426 now, as you remember the keynote of the parable of the ten virgins found in Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 to 11 uh, is, is that this is a prophecy which found its first fulfillment in the summer of 18, 18 well not just a, but it, it found its fulfillment in the 1833 to the 1844 period now, I don't know how many of you folk have heard the study we give on the ten virgins as a prophetic outline of the events to take place at the end of time and which even now are taking place in fulfillment of that prophecy but Sister White tells us in the Review and Herald that the parable of the ten virgins has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter the reference was found in an, in an August uh, 1890 Review and Herald uh, article uh, 18, I think it's 1890 I'm pretty sure it's 1890 or 1893 I'm pretty sure it's 1890 and um, then she makes it very clear starting back on page 393 of the same book Great Controversy that um, the parable began to be fulfilled my page 393 is correct that the parable began to be fulfilled back in 1833 with the going forth of the virgins to meet the bridegroom in response to the message given by God through William Mellon and his associates that the tarrying time commenced with the first disappointment in March 1844 and ended with the sounding forth of the midnight cry in August 1844 and that the closing of the door took place in, uh, in October 22, 1844 when the virgins went into the marriage and those who were not ready of course were shut out from the marriage service now what took place back then of course is taking place again today and right now we are again in the tarrying time of the parable and the very next event of course is the midnight cry which is soon to come and in commenting upon this entry into the most holy place by the wise virgins I read now on page 426 and page 427 of the book Great Controversy in the summer and autumn of 1844 the proclamation behold the bridegroom cometh was given note those words in the summer and autumn of 1844 the proclamation behold the bridegroom cometh was given now where do we find the proclamation in the Bible behold the bridegroom cometh go you out to meet him in the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew chapter 25 
the two classes represented by the wise and foolish virgins were then developed one class who looked with joy of the Lord's appearing and who had been diligently preparing to meet him another class that influenced by fear and acting from impulse had been satisfied with a theory of the truth but were destitute of the grace of God in the parable when the bridegroom came they that were ready went in with him to the marriage the coming of the bridegroom here brought to view takes place before the marriage now, now we come to what the marriage actually is the marriage represents the reception by Christ of his kingdom there's the definition the marriage represents the reception by Christ of his kingdom now it's not the only marriage because there's another marriage you read about it in Christ topic lesson page 393 uh, this one three nine three uh, is um, the pages three um, three oh three hundred and seven page three oh seven and um, this statement says by the marriage is represented the union of humanity with divinity not of Christ with the new Jerusalem so there are two very distinct and separate marriages into which we'll look more closely later but right now this statement is talking about the marriage of Christ to the new Jerusalem so let's read it again the marriage represents the reception by Christ of his kingdom the holy city of the new Jerusalem which is the capital and representative of the kingdom is called the bride the lamb's wife said the angel to John come hither and I will show thee the bride the lamb's wife he carried me away in the spirits says the prophets and showed me that great city the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God Revelation 21 verses 9 and 10 let's turn, to our, let's turn in our Bibles to this reference now Revelation 21 verse 9 and 10 and um, we'll get the context to what this scripture has to say Revelation 21 verses 9 and 10 and there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying come hither I will show thee the, the bride the lamb's wife and he carried me away in the spirit to, to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city the, new, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious even like a jasper stone clear as crystal right now we read further in the book Great Controversy clearly then the bride represents the holy city and the virgins that go out to meet the bridegroom are a symbol of the church in the revelation the people of God are said to be guests at the marriage feast as verse 9 tells you Revelation uh, 19 verse 9 let's go back there a moment could you re re uh, repeat that what you just said from Revelation 21 9 and 10 well the statement simply says that the bride that the, the, new, Jeru represents, the new Jerusalem right okay. now verse 9 of Revelation 19 says and he said unto me write blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb and he said unto me these are the true sayings of God now Sister Wade makes the point that if guests they cannot be represented as the bride so that the people of God are guests at this marriage supper of the Lamb at the New Jerusalem and the New Jerusalem itself is the bride on this occasion now we'll develop this thought of the marriage in connection with the gospel much more deeply tomorrow because our time is now gone and we'll have to discontinue at this point yes um, that statement in Christ Object Lessons it says by the marriage is represented the union of humanity with divinity so that's one marriage but then it goes on to say the wedding garment represents the character which all must possess who shall be accounted fit yes for the wedding the other wedding right but doesn't it actually mention both in that sure way? sure you got ahead of me you got ahead a little bit I was going to do that tomorrow <laughs> that's all right there it's important that we do see there are two marriages yes um, you plan to uh, come back to this uh, the, the miracle in Canaan oh cert and certainly and oh sure okay. yeah sure I was afraid I missed something there no no it goes mighty fast you got to get it it's a bionic army all these things Verse 19 was the one chapter. Revelation 19, verse 9, yeah. 19, 9. Yeah. I don't know where it is, but yeah.
the virgins are from Matthew 25. That's correct, yeah. Verse, first 11 verses. Did you 